Okay, this video is called The Western Abdomen. And what this is about is I see the same stuff all day long every day. You know, I've been a doctor over 30 years and I can tell you, me and my friends, you know, the guys around my age, we sometimes joke, we've seen hundreds of thousands of abdomens that we, we feel like we're going to vomit sometimes after we see another body CT. That's one of the reasons why I went into neuroradiology. I love the brain. I think the brain's the most interesting thing in the whole world. So I like reading brains, brain MRIs and stuff like that versus abdomens. I have to read them when I'm on call, but I find them rather boring. Okay. I have to read a lot of uh, abdomen ultrasounds also too. I could do them in my sleep. Um, anyways, what I'm trying to say is in the Western countries, medical students are taught match the yield of the pill and send the bill that all these diseases are different, but in reality, they're, most of them are quite related. Most of the chronic well-known diseases. So I'm going to explain how that all works here real quick here. Um, Here's just one picture of an abdomen, and, and basically most Western sort of middle-aged to older patients, they all got the same stuff. They all got fatty liver, almost all of them, all right? Most common cause of gallstones, about 95% of them are cholesterol gallstones. The same patients that have high cholesterol eat high-fat diets, and most of them have fatty livers, okay? Eventually, they get a fatty pancreas. This is what I'm kind of relating to you is sort of the ectopic fat theory of diabetes. You know, the main cause of insulin resistance is high-fat diets. All right, and the same patients have coronary artery atherosclerosis due to the hypertension related to high-fat, high-sodium diets and the <clears throat> high-fat being associated with atherosclerosis. These orange spots along the LAD, left anterior descending artery of the heart, are coronary artery calcifications. And by the way, I think coronary artery calcification CT is stupid. You already have, you know you've got atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries. You don't need to check with a CT. If you've been eating the Western diet and a lot of meat for a while, you're going to have coronary artery atherosclerosis, okay? All right, so anyways, this uh, brown line right here is the diaphragm, separates the abdomen from the chest. You can see the top of the, the lower part of the heart when you look at an abdomen CT. This is the coronal images, you know, meaning sliced from front to back. Okay, fatty liver is ubiquitous. When I, when I hear patient has elevated LFTs, liver function tests, I just assume it's a fatty liver. That's a safe assumption because it always is over 95% of the time. All right, now I'll show you some more of the things we see routinely on the western abdomen, so to speak. They get ischemia. The ischemia causes asymmetric uh, disc degeneration. Notice how this disc has more height. Here's the vertebral bodies of the lumbar spine. There's more height uh, to the disc space on this side than this side. And my theory, and I've ri written an entire book about this, is that you have ischemia, <clears throat> meaning a lack of blood supply, so this side of the disc degenerates faster. And so now you've got a curvature of the lumbar spine. This is called degenerative scoliosis, the scoliosis of aging. This is not teenage girl in your junior high who's wearing a brace, okay? That's more of a thoracic scoliosis, and it's a different thing. I'm talking about degenerative scoliosis of the lumbar spine due to degenerative disc disease and that is primarily due to ischemia. There's a couple of chemical causes of it, but it's primarily due to ischemia, lack of blood flow due to atherosclerosis. I also very often see abdominal aorta ectasia. I wrote triple A here on this aorta. This red thing is the abdominal aorta, bifurcates into the right and left common iliac arteries. But I wrote triple A on there for abdominal aortic aneurysm, but most of the time there's not an aneurysm. There's just ectasia, I meaning it's a little bit wide. Eventually a lot of patients will form an aneurysm, but most patients will die first from coronary artery disease before they'll ever have a significant abdominal aortic aneurysm. Okay, and the same stuff, you know, the high meat diet, the meat's acidic, the acidity causes buffering of calcium from the spine and from the muscles, and it also, there's, a, there's something to do with absorption pattern. There's more than one theory of it, but the gist of it is the acidity of the animal protein having more sulfuric amino acids like methionine and cysteine leads to a pH buffering mechanism that leads to increased calcium in the urine, leads to calciuria, so you get more kidney stones. You also get more kidney stones from caffeine and, and a few other things. I give an entire other lecture on that. That's not the point of the lecture for today. But what I wanted to make as a point is the same thing, the same diet in general that causes kidney stones causes fatty liver. I can tell you, I've seen many, many tens of thousands of uh, fatty livers and stones and it's always the same patient. Whenever it's follow up for kidney stones, that same patient on their ultrasound will have a fatty liver. Almost always. You, you, could, you could go to the bank on that. Okay, that's a pretty safe bet. All right, if you're looking at a CT scan and you can see kidney stones more uh, readily on CT than you can on um, ultrasound, you're also going to see a calcified left anterior descending coronary artery in, in the bottom of the heart there in the chest, okay, almost always. And you'll very often see degenerative disc disease with disc space narrowing and you see degenerative scoliosis. Usually it's mild, but sometimes it's more moderate or severe. All right, so these are just typical things on the Western abdomen. And what I'm trying to make a point is that these are not all separate, unique, individual diseases. These all tend to occur in patterns. 
as a common common manifestations of Western diet and lifestyle. Okay, now I'm going to show you this is abdominal pressure syndrome and this is the one described by Dennis Burkett. So Dennis Burkett was the Irish uh, surgeon, physician, uh, he did some of his training in England, operated on a lot of people in England, then he went to Africa as a Christian missionary. And he noted, he actually discovered what's called Burkitt's lymphoma and then he got the job being in charge of 10,000 hospitals for epidemiology and he saw patterns of diseases. He had some friends and researchers who shared these patterns with him and he sort of documented. He actually traveled all over <clears throat> Africa studying lymphoma. Then also he did a lot of kind of funny things. He would even collect stool samples and in interview all these people about their diets. And the, the point is this. The persons there in Africa who were eating plant-based diets, they almost never had these diseases that he used to see you know, every day in, when he was in England. So the Westerner is eating a low fiber diet. The main thing fiber does is it adds water to your stool, softens it because it attracts the water, adds bulk to the stool, and so when you poop normally it should be like a cow patty. If you're not pooping cow patties or a typical Westerner, you know, he's, he believes we should probably be getting about at least 100 grams a day of fiber, okay? Nowadays, you'll hear from people who are pretty good experts, at least 48 to 50 or so grams a day of fiber. But Burkett says we're probably designed to get about 100. And the point is, <clears throat> when you poop a nice soft cow patty, it just comes right out. There's no straining. When you're pooping out dried out stool like Tootsie Rolls, goat pellets, you strain at the stool, pushing, flexing your abdominal muscles, increasing abdominal pressure is called valsalva. That back pressure generates pressure in the rectal veins called rectal hemorrhoids. They swell. That's what happens. You sometimes wipe your butt and you get a little blood on there from these rectal hemorrhoids. All right. Increased straining, increased abdominal pressure can pop out more inguinal hernias. Um, it causes back pressure down in the leg and that causes varicose veins. Back pressure goes down into the scrotum. That causes varicoceles. That can heat up the testicles, cause infertility. So, yeah, some guy, yes, you can become infertile from being constipated, guys. You want to get more dietary fiber and eat the plant foods. Don't just take fiber supplements. That's not as good of a way to go. Back pressure causes diverticulosis, outpouching of the sigmoid colon wall. Eventually, some of those will pop. That's diverticulitis. You know, there's like at least one admission in almost every Western hospital every day for diverticulitis because the stool pops out and spills onto the abdomen, causes localized inflammation, can also progress to forming abscesses, and uh, usually it'll start to seal off pretty quick by the mesenteric fat, but it can be very painful. I've drained numerous abscesses for that reason. When I'm back in my previous life when I was an imaging guided surgeon, interventional radiologist. Okay, so anyways. Dry diet stool means you form stool balls that are like rocks called uh, fecal liths. Feces for feca, lith means stone. It happens in the appendix. It's called appendico lith. And it'll block the connection between the appendix and the cecum, this right side of the colon. The mucous glands in the appendix continue to secrete their mucus. They can't get past the stone. The appendix swells and pops. So that's why meat eaters have a lot more. And processed food eaters, which has very little fiber as well. There's no fiber in meat. Have a lot more appendicitis. Okay, And that, that'll pop and spill stool all over the abdomen. I've had to drain seven abscesses on the same patient from appendicitis, a perfed appendicitis. Okay, and like I said, the high fat diets also cause uh, stones in the gallbladder, um, cholesterol stones are called. The back pressure causes the upper part of the stomach to pop into the chest. It's called hiatal hernia. They're usually small. They're associated with gastroesophageal reflux, heartburn-like symptoms. Sometimes they're quite big. Sometimes almost the entire stomach can be in the chest. It's called the intrathoracic stomach. The chronic inflammation from the gastric acidity, which you're not used to having above the diaphragm, can induce a change in the epithelial lining of the esophagus hyphen stomach there, and it's called Barrett's esophagus. And that's inflammation, and this leads to a type of cancer called adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. It used to be squamous cell with smoker drinker cancer. Nowadays, we see more adenocarcinoma, it's a different type of cancer in this area, from the gastro chronic gastroesophageal reflux, usually abbreviated GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And you know, way, the way Western medicine thinks, it doesn't say anything about diet, it just says, oh, take this pill, like a proton pump inhibitor or something. And then when you start blocking the acid in the stomach, you create new problems. Now you get more bacteria from the food, survive, get into the small bowel, you can get SIBO, you know, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and you can get other kinds of problems. You can have problems with, um, it actually can lead to dementia, decreased processing of your nitrates to nitrites to nitric oxide, <clears throat> vasodilator precursors, and can increase your atherosclerosis. Okay, we're not going to get into all that stuff. We're going to focus on the abdomen. This is a talk about the Western abdomen, but what I'm kind of showing you here is how all these diseases go together. I'm going to explain them in more detail in just a moment. The other thing is typical patient's fat. You know, you look at the side 
scout image of a CAT scan, you see this big fat belly typically. And then, and then, you know, the typical macho thing for guys is, oh, it's just a beer belly. No, genius, it's an estrogen belly, okay? You look like a pregnant female, and often the boobs are kind of big. So we call them man boobs, are called moobs. And they're not just fat, they're often gynecomastia. I mean, there's proliferation of breast ductal cells underneath there. Because the big fat belly, um, the adipose cells, fat cells, have increased amounts of um, aromatase enzyme will convert testosterone to estrogen. Um, in addition, the same diet that they're eating with all the beer um, and as well, there's sometimes estrogenic, you know, zea in there. And there's other estrogens in the meat quite often. They're given estrogen to fatten up the animal more rapidly. I'll explain why in addition. There's other reasons why a high meat processed food diet increases estrogenic levels in the body significantly. In a woman, it'll increase her risk of breast cancer. It'll increase her risk of uterine cancer. Okay. And so sometimes this is called the apple-shaped body in comparison with a pear-shaped body, which is more fat also in the thighs and the hips and whatnot. Often women have more of that pear shape too. All right, so one thing I want to talk about is just uh, real quick, the difference between the Pima and the Tarahumara. Tarahumara, they live in northern Mexico, and they used to be combined with the Pima population. They were indigenous to northern Mexico. And the Tarahumara are world famous for being ultra-marathon runners. A bunch of famous American runners, including Ruth Hydras, went and visited them. They're for real. Uh, Chris McDougall, I don't think he's related to John McDougall, wrote an entire book about him, I think, called Born to Run. Uh, I'll show you in a moment. Chris Urich, the famous ultra-marathoner, went out and visited him as well. Uh, Nathan Pritikin patterned his diet after them because these guys will run 100, 200 miles in two days. Um, William O'Connor is the famous researcher who wrote papers about their incredible health. And they had a real simple diet, you know, lots of corn, which you'd expect, some beans, local greens, for example, uh, squash. Okay, the Pima were the population combined with them, but in the Mexican-American War of 1848, the populations got split, and the Pima were absorbed into Arizona. In Arizona, they started eating a Western SAD diet, and they're just a disaster of health. They're obese, typically. Uh, they get all the Western problems, you know, coronary artery disease, this is a cabbage, coronary artery bypass, grass, go for open heart surgery, you know, midline whoosh, rotating surgical blade through the sternum, no fun. Okay, they often end up with cardiac pacemakers, tons of gallstones, they go for a gallbladder surgery, cholecystectomy, lots of appendicitis, uh, sigmoid resection for diverticulitis, they get bad diabetes, they get their foot amputated, then their leg below the knee, BKA is a below knee amputation, okay? So they're just a bunch of scars. This is what I mean by if you don't get your act together, you just get a bunch of pills and then you get chopped up like this, okay? Cataracts, so that's the story of the Pima versus the Tadomara. And I got a picture, okay, well here is... Chris Yurick, the famous ultra marathon, he went out there to visit the Pima, you know, and these guys are great runners, and so he wrote a book about that, too. Um, oh, there's Chris McDougall, the guy who wrote the Born to Run book. Okay, here's a picture of the Pima back in the 1800s before they took on the Western diet. They used to be really fit, you know, they used to look like a college wrestling team, these guys. That's how humans are supposed to look, fit, okay, and slim and strong. Okay, this is a, a, a joke from the movie Colors, and it's with regard to, you know, Robert Duvall and Sean Penn were the two guys in the movie Colors, and the young guy says to the old guy, um, this is, you can imagine, it comes from a joke about two bulls. So the young bull says to the old bull, hey, hey, look down there in the valley, all these female cows, why don't we run down there and have sex with them? And the old bull, and have sex with one of them. And the old bull says, why don't we walk down there and have sex with all of them? So the, what the joke I'm getting at here is with regard to these diseases, you know, the, the conventional medicine says take one pill for gastroesophageal reflux, take another pill for the discomfort and pain in your gallstones, take another pill for your coronary arteries and another pill for this. And what I'm saying is eat low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet and minimize all these problems, okay? Because then you remove the root cause. All right, so we went through this about um, Dennis Burkitt's abdominal pressure syndrome, all the manifestations of that. And that's the way you prevent them. Get your dietary fiber. You only get fiber from plants. There's no fiber in meat. Um, here's diverticulitis where you have these little like air bubble-like things sticking out of the wall of the sigma. That's the diverticuli. And they're called diverticulosis. And one of them pops. Itis means inflammation. So notice how regular fat's relatively clean. Um, it's pretty clean. Here's regular clean fat down here. And then this fat's real dirty. That's because some stool has popped out of a diverticulum and it's caused inflammation of the mesenteric fat. It can be very painful, and that can progress to an abscess and other problems. So that is typical diverticulitis, typical reason for patients to be admitted to a hospital. Okay, now I'm showing you the fat business. 
excessive dietary fat, excessive high fructose corn syrup, excessive alcohol, which is processed pretty much like fat, causes fatty liver. And once you've got fatty liver, now you can no longer uh, accurately measure blood glucose during the fasting phase. And you will start to keep on running gluconeogenesis, pumping glucose into the blood. So you get chronic hyperglycemia, including during fasting. Postprandial means after eating is mostly skeletal muscle increase in accumulation of fat. Intramyocellular lipid, it's called. That's been shown on nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, the work of Gerald Shulman. You can see Gerald Shulman's uh, video on YouTube. You just type in Gerald Shulman 2018 Banting Lecture. You see, wow, it's fantastic. The guy's a genius. Okay, so anyways, fatty liver basically means diabetes of the liver, okay? Pre-diabetes or diabetes of the liver. And eventually you start accumulating fat in the pancreas as the pancreas beta cells fail and the pancreas gets replaced by fat. It's called fatty atrophy of the pancreas. Ask any radiologist. They see that all the time. Most of them don't even know that that means diabetes, but that's what it is. Fatty atrophy of the pancreas, loss of the beta cells, and you just have replacement of uh, the, the pancreas with fat. Okay. Um, these gallstones, too, when they pop up, first of all, they can block the cystic duct here and cause cholecystitis, very painful. It's a common reason to have the gallbladder taken out surgically. It's less common, but the, the gallstones can also dislodge, go through the cystic duct, go into the common bowel duct, and obstruct it in here. That can cause jaundice, for example. That can also cause pancreatitis. More common in women. You know, the mnemonic for that one is fat female 40 flatulent, okay, uh, with the, again, eating the high fat, high meat diets. Okay, here is, you know, this is a cover from one of the books I wrote about the spine. Basically, the point of it is here is the abdominal aorta runs in front of the spine. The lumbar artery runs mid-height of the vertebral body, gives a twig to the upper end plate, lower end plate, and then the disc gets glucose from this. It doesn't, the disc does not have any blood vessels, but through diffusion, it'll get glucose supplied by this end plate artery. And when you get atherosclerosis, here I'll show you in a moment, when you get atherosclerosis of the abdominal aorta on the posterior wall, very typically, it'll narrow, that's called stenose, or occlude the lumbar artery, and then you have a deficiency of blood supply to the disc. And again, the disc is alive, running on anaerobic glycolysis. This would be the lumbar spine. So here's the sacrum, S1, 2, 3. Here's the lumbar spine. We count up L5, L4, L3. These are the disc bases. So this one, two VBs and their intervening disc is called a spinal segment. Okay, when you have a lack of... Uh, glucose delivery to maintain this disc, it'll start to fail. It'll dry out and it'll crack. Um, the outer part of the disc is called the annulus fibrosis, like a steel belted radial tire. And the inner part is the nucleus pulposus, nice and soft. It's like a jelly donut, okay? And so when the annulus fibrosis dries out and cracks, the nucleus pulposus will leak into it and you can get disc herniations. So just have a a, a crack in the annular fissures. We go, usually call them fissures rather than tears. Tears implies a traumatic event. It doesn't have to be a traumatic event. Uh, so that's why the word will be annular fissure. All right, and you'll see that on an MRI pretty easily. Okay, what happens is then you get segmental instability whereby because this disc has lost its height and it's dried out, it can't do its job effectively. And the spine has a lot of proprio receptors, motion receptors, and they sense the abnormal motion. So in order to fix the abnormal motion, they'll start laying down calcification. And these calcifications will grow upward. They're called bone spurs or osteophytes until they fuse with the one from the vertebra above. So let's say this disc fails. Then this bone spur will grow from here and grow from here, and they'll eventually fuse. And once they fuse at a couple levels, that's called DISH. It means diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. I see this all day long, every day. It's ubiquitous, okay? This is all part of what I would call the routine Western ab. The stuff I'm showing you, this is not like rare. This is like what most people in Western countries get. And it just keeps getting worse and worse as they age. So that's why I'm saying is, people sometimes say to me, oh, you're so absolutist. You know, one of my viewers told me, go, you know, you kind of come off like a jerk. You tell people they either have to become a vegan or they're screwed. Well, people don't like that. People are not going to listen to you. They're just going to shut you off and never hear from you again. And that's why you don't have that many views. And you know what I say? I go, look, my, my goal is not to be popular. Most people think in what I would call a herbivore way, just like we have herbivore physiology, we have herbivore thinking, which applies to social stuff. When in Rome, do as the Romans do, you know, everything in moderation. All right, that's fine for social getting along with people. But for health, you don't want to think that way. You want to be absolutist, biblical, Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not eat bad food. And bad food means high fat food, high sodium food, food with oil in it. 
And the older you get, the more fragile you get. So you can't get away with, you can say, well, I've always eaten this type of junk food. Well, you know what? You could get away with it at 20 years of age. You're not going to get away with the same stuff when you're 50, 60, and whatnot. Most Americans do not age well. They're cognitively slow by the time they're in their 50s. They're weak. They're tired looking. You don't want that, okay? And this is just showing when the annulus fibrosis fails, you can get a straight back herniation of the disc called a protrusion. You can get an extrusion where it herniates out and then starts going up and down above and below the level of the disc base height. You can herniate the disc into the bone itself. It's called a Schmorl's node. You can accumulate fat in the spinal canal. It's called epidural lipomatosis. Again, I see these things every day. All right, now here's showing what this looks like from a side view. Side view is called a sagittal view here. And so on a sagittal view, here's a failed disc where you get gas in this. That's called gaseous disc degeneration. To simply lose disc space height like this would be called just disc degeneration with loss of height, okay? Uh, all of these discs, I see this all the time. Every single disc is abnormal. This is the one closest to normal at L5S1. So all of these are degenerated, these discs. Gaseous disc degeneration, gaseous disc degeneration, gaseous disc degeneration. Um, loss of disc space height, formation of small bone spurs, bigger bone spurs growing towards each other, almost fused here. Okay, you can see these bone spurs are growing at every single level because these discs are not working correctly. So this would be described as lumbar spine, multi-level degenerative disc disease, most severe at L4-5. Okay, and then you can also form growing osteophytes that bridge posteriorly. You got it, you, got, you can see them right here. It'll typically begin as calcification, ossification along the posterior disc space. And there's a ligament that runs in this location called the posterior longitudinal ligament. What starts out as calcification then forms into actual bone, so it becomes ossification. You can see it's happened at this level as well, too. Okay, so this becomes called OPLL, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, OPLL. And you can also get fusion of the, the vertebral bodies across the disc space. And this is called vertebral bodies, the word body, so it's interbody fusion. And do we have any here? This one looks like it's progressing to interbody fusion, maybe partway there, not all the way there, but on its way. So you can see the spine is protecting itself from segmental instability, abnormal motion um, at, a, at a spinal segment. And the reason is the spine has all these proprioceptors. It has to protect itself. If this motion got too severe, the spine could be almost like transected, and you could injure the spinal cord of the nerve roots. The job of the spine, the bones, is to protect the spinal cord and the nerve roots. So the proprioceptors sense a problem early, and the spine fixes it by fusing that level, growing these osteophytes, these bone spurs. And it happens all the way from the sacrum, you know, all the way on up to the to the skull. It goes the entire way. And I, by the way, I'm the one who figured this all out. It is true in the 1980s they had papers about ischemic disc disease. All right, but I figured out it's all the same thing. OPLL, as well as olfossification of the ligamentum flavum, interbody fusion, and just going all the way up to the, to, the, to the spine. And it's primarily a scheming phenomenon, but I believe it's also secondarily uh, glyphosate, I believe, you know, Stephanie Seneff has written about this. It's substituting out, you know, for glycine. It is thought by Stephanie Seneff in particular at every third residue, and it's damaging the collagen, which can lead to these types of problems as well. Scurvy can lead to a little something similar because it damages collagen. You need vitamin C to make collagen, and F- minus can do it too because F- minus can distort collagen. And if you don't have good collagen, you can't make good ligaments that have to run all the way up and down the spine. Anterior longitudinal ligament runs anteriorly. Posterior longitudinal ligament runs along the posterior surface of the vertebral bodies. So those are contributory mechanisms. And most Westerners are exposed to F- in their tap water, municipal tap water. Plus they're exposed typically to the high-fat diets, high-sodium diets leading to hypertension, diabetes, and ischemia. Ischemia meaning lack of blood flow to the spine. Okay, so that's how it all works. And so that's why you want to prevent those problems because they just destroy your body everywhere. All right, and this is what I meant by when, let's say the lumbar artery is tight on this side, stenotic, narrowed on one side, the disc will fail worse on that side. Not quite as bad on this side. The lumbar artery, I don't know if you can see it on here, uh, they run right mid-height of the VB. You'll see them up here if you have a better picture. And the more the disc fails, the more narrow the disc space gets. It often gets replaced by gas. Um, this is virtually complete failure of the disc. This might eventually fuse the bones. And so because they fuse they, they're damaged asymmetrically, more loss of disc space height here than here, you get this uneven scoliosis. And this is degenerative scoliosis of the lumbar spine. And then you're also getting atherosclerosis. And the same risk factors for atherosclerosis are for aneurysm formation, weakening and softening of the wall. There's even a writer who, who believes that what's happening is there's an outer layer to arteries called the vasorum, And that can become occluded with a thrombus and cause vasovasorum thrombosis due to atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis, by the way, is just a blood clot, all right? And so you can get the blood clot in the outer layer of an arterial wall 
the third layer, so to speak. And when that infarcts, the wall gets weak. So vasovasorum occlusion due to thrombosis will infarct the outer layer of the arterial wall, the adventitia, and that can lead to aneurysm formation. So that's an important point. The same people who get atherosclerosis also get aneurysms of their abdominal aorta, and they also get coronary artery disease, and then they also get degenerative spine. So what I'm saying is the reason I call this Western abdomen is these patients all have the same thing. Okay. I don't know if you can hear that vacuum. Some obnoxious family members vacuuming right now. No sense of what I'm doing. No one cares. Okay, they all think this vegan stuff's a big joke. At least I'm home though. I'm not at the racetrack wasting money. All right. So, anyways, same things also cause kidney stones. You know, the high meat diets, the high acidity. We talked about this. The stone will typically start out, let's say, in the renal calyx here and the fimbria of the calyx, and then it'll get dislodged, it'll go into the renal pelvis, sometimes it'll occlude the ureter right here. Most often it occludes the ureter distally, where the ureter, that's the, the, the tube that connects the kidney to the bladder. Um, this is called the ureterovesical junction. The urinary bladder is called the vesicle. Um, so the stone will become obstructed right here. All right, here is a picture of leaky gut. And I don't know, I meant to kind of show, I meant to show better, I don't know how well I showed it on this picture that you'll also get kidney stones, these same patients, okay? So the same patient is going to have kidney stones, they're going to have gallstones, they're going to have a fatty liver, they're going to have a lumbar spine degenerative disc disease with degenerative scoliosis, they're going to have coronary artery calcifications. They've all got the same thing. Most of the patients will have the same thing. It'll just be a question of how severe it is, okay? But they all got the same thing. And that's what's so great about, you know, going low-fat vegan, you got a chance to prevent almost all of this stuff, okay? All right, then I'm, now I'm getting into things that are a little less common. Lots of people have leaky gut problems, but they quite often, you know, we don't routinely obtain CAT scans for this, and we usually don't see this unless it's progressed to something more severe, like an actual colitis, ulcerative colitis, or Crohn's colitis, Crohn's ileitis of the distal small bowel, for example. But the lack of dietary fiber leads to leaky gut. I gave an entire lecture before on what causes leaky gut, on autoimmune disease. So I'm not going to go into all the details right now, but just be aware you need fiber so that the good gut bacteria can make butyrate, the four carbon fatty acid. These are called short chain fatty acids right here. And that's used by the enterocytes, the gut lining cells to make tight junctions. And if you don't get enough dietary fiber or you eat these things that damage the good bacteria, you end up with leaky gut. There's a whole bunch of them. If I had autoimmune disease, I would go through all these and, and stop doing all of them. Again, I'll go into that in much more detail in other lectures. Once you got leaky gut, you start absorbing gram-negative endotoxin, which is LPS, lipopolysaccharide, gram-positive endotoxin, which is LTA, lipotychoic acid. That gets into your blood. It makes your blood more prothrombotic. The fibrinogen clotting protein actually changes from an alpha helix uh, shape to a beta-pleated sh sheet shape. Alpha helix is like a slinky, kind of cylindrical, versus beta-pleated sheet is um, flat, and it'll stack up like a deck of cards. And you don't want that because those clots are hard to lice. That's a whole, I give an entire lecture. Most of the things I'm talking about in this video, I give an entire lecture on them. I'm just quickly summarizing them all as a Western abdomen. Okay, and so here is, um, you know, thickening of the bowel wall. This is ulcerated colitis, like pseudopolyp appearance. And notice that the patient also has a fatty liver. You can tell it's a fatty liver because the liver is less dense than the spleen. Normally the liver should always be more dense than the spleen. So right now he's got a fatty liver. Okay, so every patient presents in a little bit of a different way. This is a younger patient, I can tell because the spine looks so good. Eventually this patient will end up with generous spine disease. Notice I can see the lumbar arteries running mid-high to the vertebra. You can see them you know, at each level. There's the lumbar arteries mid-high to the VB. All right, um, so let's see. I got a couple more slides. They're almost done with all this stuff here. Okay, I showed the guy again. Always oh, going to show estrogen stuff. I'll real quickly go through the estrogen stuff. I won't take too much of your time, but the high estrogens you get from the meat-based diet, you get fibroids. You know, we used to call them. I had one in tanning. We call them fireballs in the Eucharist. All right. So here's an exophytic fibroid, meaning it's growing off the top of the uterus, the fundus, projecting upward. But they'll project into the uterus. They'll cause bleeding. They'll cause pain. Very common reason for a hysterectomy. Same patients have increased risk of breast cancer. Here's estrogen. It's a steroid hormone. So uh, here's it's steroid hormone means built on a cholesterol backbone. Okay. Uh, so there's four rings: A, B, C, and D rings. Okay, it's uh, got a polar component with the hydroxyl group. Estradiol means it's an estrogen. Di means two, all two alcohol groups. So this is polar, this is polar. This is the one that interacts with the estrogen receptor. The unique thing about estrogens is they have an aromatic ring here, meaning a benzene ring, three double bonds. And these double bonds will resonate amongst the six carbons. And what this means is it has great shelf life stability. 
This is antimicrobial, the OH group. It'll kill fungi. So this is why it's in all the personal care products because you got good shelf life stability. The company can keep their product on the shelf four or five years and it kills mold, okay, fungi. So because of that, that's a perfect preservative for a company. Good shelf life, antifungal. So mold doesn't grow in your product. It doesn't get sent back to you. So you make more money. The combination of the benzene ring or the hydroxyl group is called the phenol. So you're going to see phenol all over the place. And you'll often hear it as abbreviated phenol. The unique thing about it is the this is a estrogen. The hydroxyl group right here will form a hydrogen bond with the active site of an estrogen receptor. So pretty much anything with this phenol group on it is going to activate this estrogen receptor. And that's why there's tons of estrogenic chemicals. It's kind of a promiscuous receptor, meaning that it'll bind with lots of things, almost anything that's got a phenol group on it. Because evolutionarily, there wasn't much competition. It's just all these modern chemicals. So a typical example, everybody's heard of BPA, bisphenol A. Bis means two when they're not next to each other. So here's a hydroxyl group, here's a hydroxyl group. There's two phenol groups separated by a couple carbons in the middle. And people got pissed off about bisphenol causing so many problems that they said, oh, it should be banned, it should be banned. The companies go, yeah, sure, we'll ban it, we'll ban it, yeah, we'll help you out. And they just put a sulfate group in the middle. You still got phenol on each side. This is, you know, bisphenol S, all right? So it's, it's still going to activate the estrogen receptor, and there's a whole bunch of variants on that. Companies are never going to stop doing these things. It's too profitable. Here's a typical parabenzoic acid. So parabenzoic acid is a, a preservative. This is a typical one that's in deodorants, for example. And deodorants are a major cause of the increase in upper outer quadrant breast cancer. It used to be about 30%, now it's about 60%. Because this is an estrogen, estrogenic preservative. Again, you got a benzene ring on it, and you got a hydroxyl group. And then people are rubbing their deodorant in their armpit. You know, here's a deodorant going into the armpit, and it's got typically aluminum to plug up the sweat glands, and then an estrogenic preservative. That's two estrogens, because aluminum is a metalloestrogen. And they often shave first, increasing transdermal absorption. You got shared lymphatics between the armpit and the breast. And I always say, you know, you got all these women running around with their pink ribbons, and it's like, you know, they mean well, but, you know, they're kind of stupid. Why not empower yourselves by learning about estrogen chemistry? It's really easy rather than just give money to the company, you know, it's going to make chemo, okay, and sell that. So anyways, um, these are in tons of these personal care products, you know, and I've joked before too. In my bathroom, there's zero personal care product except for a transparent bar of soap, the simplest one possible. And my wife, there's like 55 of them, you know. And um, I said to her, I said, you know, you know you're, you're an idiot. Why do you got 55 products here? You know, there's all kinds of estrogenic chemicals and other toxic chemicals in here. You don't even know what you're putting on your face. And she's like, oh, you don't understand. A woman would rub shit on her face if she thought it would make her more beautiful. I go, well, that's what you're doing, you know, kind of stupid. And she goes, well, you know what? You're just, she said to me, I'm just jealous because I'm not aging well, that I got wrinkles. I got a, a big bitch line right between my forehead right there. And she says, I need Botox. But... You know, she's just joking because she knows I'm aging a lot better than her. Um, anyways. Okay, here's another thing with uh, eating a high processed food and meat diet. Uh, normally, the liver excretes excess estrogen in our blood, goes into the bile, and then we defecate it out of our body. That's how we lower our estrogen levels. When you eat a low-fiber diet because you eat a lot of meat and processed food, there's, almost, there's zero fiber in meat, almost none in processed food then you get bad gut bacteria and they unconjugate the estrogen, meaning that they cut the bond between the estrogen and the um, glucuronic acid. And then the estrogen is reabsorbed in the blood. So meat eater, processed food eaters have higher blood estrogen levels. And there's also, like I said, lots of estrogens in tap water because municipal water is too expensive for them to really filter it effectively. They don't have good carbon filters. So you need a carbon filter. Pretty cheap to get a carbon filter to get those estrogens out of your water. And I've had women who tell me every single woman in their family before age 35 had to get a hysterectomy for fibroids. So you don't want that, okay? Because they're all a bunch of meat eaters and they drink tap water that's not filtered, okay? And they don't eat enough plant foods. Um, and they're probably rubbing a bunch of personal care products that are estrogenic on themselves. Okay, and so what I'm basically saying is if you want to be good at understanding disease and healing people and be able to get dramatic improvements in population health, you have to know nutrition and toxicology. Those are the two most important things. And I also say, you know, your doctors mean well and they got good grades in school, but they don't know this. Nutrition, toxicology, and epidemiology are essentially not taught in medical school. They learn a tiny bit of epidemiology. They're told that they were taught nutrition with their biochemistry class, but they don't really learn. They learn a little bit about cholesterol, about LDL particles, but they don't even really explain that to them. And so that's why most doctors, including internists that deal with chronic disease every day, they don't know this. I guarantee they don't know it. Because I know I talk to lots of them all the time. They don't know this stuff. 
and there's no incentive because they get paid to practice the standard of care. And the standard of care is a big joke. Basically, doctors at Ivy League and other real famous medical centers, they have a deal with Big Pharma. Big Pharma is like, look, if you promote our drugs, we'll give you grant money, okay? And then we'll, that'll get you promoted. The more papers you write, the more you get promoted. So you promote it, but you write a bunch of papers saying how great drugs are. Then you get promoted at your regular job, getting an increased salary. You get you get money from the grants. So you get money from the grant. You can take your family on vacation when you present your paper at a meeting. So everybody's happy. The wife is happy. The university's happy. The professor's happy. Big pharma's happy. Everybody's happy, but the patient gets screwed. And that's what I mean to patients. No one cares about you. You need to stop thinking anyone gives a rat's tail about you. I can tell you there's almost no medical center or clinic that even keeps track of outcomes because it's irrelevant. What happens to you is irrelevant. Relevant. You're a joke, okay? And the reason I say that is because <clears throat> they never track outcomes and they never will track outcomes. And the reason they'll never track outcomes is if they competed on outcomes, somebody would just start treating with low-fat plant-based diets and they would win the battle. So nobody wants nobody wants that to happen. And the only way to prevent that to happen is not keep track of outcomes. So it'll never happen, okay? Um, outside of a research study, I've never heard of anybody tracking their outcomes, you know, other than a few people that are planning to publish or they want to show off how good they are because they're using nutrition. All right, so anyways, look how simple this is. Spartan vegan diet, it's very much like, you know, McDougal diet, Esselstyn diet. I'm even a little more strict than them. So basically, you know, here's all the lifestyle thing. Get these things right, your family, your friends, your stress management. Get some exercise. Uh, get some sunshine. You need all that. Get your sleep, super important, and religion makes people a lot healthier, okay? Eat your starches. Best food is starches. It's a polymer of glucose wrapped in fiber, so it gives it has low caloric density, stretches your stomach, early satisfaction of hunger. The fiber has to be peeled off by intestinal enzymes in your uh, in your small intestine, for example. Then you get slow absorption of the glucose, so you get prolonged satisfaction of hunger, prolonged blood glucose in a normal zone with the least number of calories. So all the healthy populations, they're starch-based, all right? And once they go away from that, they all get fat and sick. You know, look at the Asian populations that used to eat white rice, you know, 85 to 95% of the calories. They're all a bunch of toothpicks, no diabetes, no hypertension, almost zero autoimmune disease, hardly any cancer. Okay, then they start becoming westernized, eating oils, meats, all these processed foods, and they start having all this obesity, diabetes, hypertension, uh, coronary artery disease, and early onset dementia. Fruits are also real good. Fruits are a little complicated. I gave an entire lecture on that. They don't satisfy hunger quite as well, so there is a risk of overeating them, but they're really good especially if you exercise a lot. Veggies got all kinds of good nutrients for you. The greens, nitric oxide precursors, and the nitrates. The only supplement I take is methylcobalamin B12. Um, we'll talk about all these other things in more detail, but the point I'm going to say is like, instead, the typical person is like, oh, well, I'm not ready for that. Oh, I'm not going to become a vegan. No way, no way. I would rather die than go vegan. And what I try to let them know is I say, look, basically, you're kind of screwed, okay? These are patients I'll talk to, and they'll have a lot of major medical problems. They don't even understand how sick they are. And so what I believe is the correct appetite is to say, you mean I don't have to be fat, sick, and stupid like almost everybody I meet over age 60? I'm 60, by the way. I have zero medical problems. I'm physically fit, strong, energetic. I can concentrate, you know, all day long. Uh, and I hopefully I'll try to keep it that way. And I know it's because I went this way because I was fat. I went through a fat phase for a couple of years in my 30s. And that's when I went vegetarian and eventually vegan. And thank God for that. I, my attitude is, thank God there's something I can do so I don't have to be fat, sick, and stupid like almost everybody else in a Western country over age 60. Okay? And, you know, if you're a nice person, great. That'll help you manage your stress. But you can't... Diet's the most important thing. They've shown that from all the rationing studies and the time during World War I, World War II, and all that stuff, that diet is the most important thing. Yes, stress management is good. Your sun, your sleep... Your religion, all that stuff is good. Your exercise, all that stuff is good. But the most important thing is diet to keep arteries open. Um, so that's what it pretty much comes down to. And I, I just wanted to make the point. Everybody's got the same disease. And the way to stop it is to get your diet fixed and avoid the other toxins. There's complexity of toxins. I, I go into these in other lectures, but I just wanted to make the point for this lecture. This is what the Western abdomen is all about. And almost all these diseases are caused by some variation on the same thing due to excessive lack of fiber or excessive dietary fat, excessive animal protein, etc. So anyways, hope that was helpful.